Next, we'll have a uh, talk from Bjorn about the Super Facility API. So going right directly from Debbie talking about how we should be integrating with APIs more. Thanks, Nick. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm a bit remote, so I had power outages, so apologies if I'm cutting out then. Um, all right, so I will be talking about the Super Facility API. And as you heard from Debbie already, uh, NERS supports a large number of users and projects from DB uh, experimental and observation facilities. And uh, the, the Super Facility project was born out of these uh, requirements. And the API simply was one of the things that our partners wanted and that we developed uh, in the course of the Super Facility project. So I'm going to motivate it. I think maybe some of you have seen the slide already, but I'm going to motivate it with a with a example use case. Uh, one is that uh, experiments, external facilities, they produce a lot of data. They can't process it on site, so they copy it over to an HPC center and process it there. In order for this cross facility workflow uh, to work, there has to be quite some communication uh, between the team at the experimental site and uh, the center. For example, one thing is, you know, uh, it's a very basic requirement and you know, um, is nurse gap or do you have enough compute power, uh, compute um, hours uh, on nurse? Then we have to, then they have to move the data over and then, you know, then you submit a job and you monitor the job and then download uh, files or immediate results execute any other arbitrary commands. And then once they're done, they might want to move the data back or move it to the archive. And why do we want to uh, use an API for this? So um, these facilities, they, uh, they often build like complex uh, workflow tools and they essentially build those for their own user base. Um, so there is a, so doing all these steps manual is kind of uh, no longer an option because it's kind of the same workflow over and over again. And, you know, it's actually one computer talking, one machine talking to another machine. So, um, the entire workflow needs to run unattended, needs to minimize the human in the loop. There might be hundreds and thousands of jobs need to be tracked. Um, and then also the, the user on the side might not be like, a the, the traditional user, like a person, but instead of computed like a, a collaboration account. And for this to work, uh, NERC, NERSC has to become kind of machine readable. So that means like we have to present computer readable um, interface and endpoints that they can just integrate into their software. This kind of allows this feeling of, um, of NERSC inside. So they kind of just, oh, it can process it locally, but they flip a switch and then the entire workflow will run on NERSC uh, resources. And one other thing where we also decided to, to redo the API to make a new API is that there's a lot of good tooling out there and it's it's become uh, simpler and simpler and there's a lot of large community for HP APIs. So it's really not, uh, it's really no longer optional to, to have an API for an HPC center. And of course the, the overall uh, goal is this simplified um, graph where essentially the the link is so so close that it's absolutely um, that the user doesn't even know um, that their jobs are running on an HPC center. So the vision for an API is that all nurse interaction are callable um, to allow automated workflows without a human in the loop and. Um, for the Super Facility API, we implement a few endpoints, like a status endpoint to check you now what, what the status is, accounting for uh, for, in, for your compute hours, uh, compute, of course, to submit jobs. Um, then we had to in, add a few endpoints that are at an endpoint that is a bit unusual. It's a task endpoint because a lot of the operations that you do, I mean, if you're in a terminal, you type a command, you know, the terminal goes and just like it, it, it executes something or you submit to, to Slurm and then the job is just submitted, but it's not executed right away. Right? So a lot of the inf interactions with an HPC center asynchronous. So we, but the API shouldn't be. So that's why any operation that takes a lot of time will instead spawn a task, and then you query the task 
uh, what's uh, what the status is. Best way to implement a task endpoint. There also some miscellaneous endpoints for like just command execution utilities or upload and download. So in the middle, you see like an example request. It's just a simple get request uh, curl. And there you can see, uh, you know, I just want to know what the status of permanent is. And then you get like a JSON formatted um, uh, result back. And you see here that for this particular request, that permanent was active. And um, we're not only developing this API or improving this API for our users or for people that actually build workforce, but also for us. So we internally, we integrated part of our own services with the API. One example is, for example, Jupyter Hub. Um, if you see like this banner in Jupyter Hub that something's wrong with NERSC but like the perimeter is degraded, it will actually pull this information uh, from our uh, from the SuperCG API. All right, let's let's uh, dive a bit into uh, what what the changes between manual interaction with NERSC and the SuperCG API is. For example, if you want to check if you want to check the status, you would have to SSH in, you get like the banner, or you ping specific services. But now you can just query the the status API and submit a job goes through S batch. The API goes to root endpoint monitoring goes through SQ and the uh, and Superfix API goes over the compute endpoint and the task endpoint. And then if you if you know that you have an experiment coming up in the future and want to see is NERSC available in a week, then you can check for our uh, planned outages also over like a more um, explicit route of the status if there's like any outages planned. And uh, I want to quickly note here that the API as it is as it is built today is primarily for people who would like to build automated tools uh, for their own user group and not necessarily for like each and every end user. So if you, you know if you think about you want to change something to the API or want to uh, uh, send out a request to us for for changes, keep that in mind that you know it's not it's not replacing your SS your SSH or your uh, Jupyter access to NERSC. All right, let's see how it how it works out for a model use case. Right, so if you plan and check a very different resource, you've got a status endpoint, moving data to storage endpoint currently, that's not uh, a functional for external transfers, but uh, we hope to improve that in the future. Um, jobs go compute and tasks, and then, um, you know, just simple stuff like uh, LS if it goes over utilities, and then moving data again over the storage endpoint. All right, so uh, since we launched the uh, uh, the API, uh, we um, in as part of the super facility project, we also included our um, external facility partners, uh, our, our key engagements, and they come up with they came up with like sample workflows where they integrated the the API. So it's quickly go home one of a few of those. So I think Debbie mentioned already that there's a, a whole lot of uh, projects that are using the API. Today we get a request almost every other every two seconds, and um, one example is, for example, is the the D three D National Fusion Facility. They do automated data processing between each of the plasma shots to reconstruct the shape and properties of the plasma. We have um, NSEM, our uh, a local user facility for electron microscopy, and they um, do automated processing for for the four D stem. Data with it with the Distiller app. That's like one example of a successful integration into an existing uh, user app. And you hear about more about NSAM in the next presentation by Sam and Peter. And then another example is um, the Linear Current Light Source uh, down in Stanford, and they do automated data processing for serial diffraction scattering workflows. And I quickly go over this. So uh, they have a bunch of questions. So, uh, based in the user facility, you know, how does photosynthesis, photosynthesis happen? How do drugs stock uh, with proteins from our cells? How jet fade? All these fundamental questions that try to answer with their free electron laser. And the way it works is they shoot molecules through this pulse laser, collect the diffraction data, and this can be quite a lot. 
Um, so, you know, with the next, with the latest upgrade, the, the amount of data that comes out, out of CLS is just uh, humongous. So if they have like all, I think all user facilities that use x-rays to produce 2D data have this big problem that they're producing way too much data and they can't, simply can't handle it. So there's, there's a desire to burst it uh, to nurse. So the device, this, this, uh, this workflow of service, um, a set of microservices, and they have a service called ARP that interfaces with the, with the SF API and that uh, submits job and uses also the utilities endpoint to do all kinds of uh, smaller commands and then download some intermediate results. And of course they have to go the task because many of these uh, um, interactions are asynchronous. Anyway, it's one example of a successful integration. But maybe for you as a user, it's more interesting, or for you as an integrator, I would say, uh, it's more interesting how more interesting how the API can be used so you get access to the API. So um, we published the entire API uh, interface over um, like a Swagger page. And if you go, I just have it as a tab open here. For example, if you go to api.nostic.gov API version 1.2, you can see all the available endpoints and you can see what uh, the, the structure of the output and the input is. And um, you can even, you know, if you, they'll get to it later, but if you, or if you're authorized to use the plan, so if you get like the, the, the token for it, you can also run uh, um, commands here that are uh, privileged that require of, uh, authorization. But yes, as, as a simple thing, you can, for example, check the status here. It should work, work before. So you can see already like machine readable output of all the systems services that knows. Okay. Yeah, so this is an interactive, up-to-date, self-documenting uh, web page. You can see all the endpoints, payloads, and example code with, with any dev environment. Um, and you know, still is this famer endpoints with significant work asynchronous is something to look, to look out for. So every time you spawn, uh, you you submit something to one of these endpoints, you have to check. You get a task ID back, and you have to check it uh, to see if it if the work has been executed. You can also go through all our user docs and examples of docs and also of services as an API. So the API is a service at NERSC. And yeah, I think I went over authorization. So some of these endpoints like status don't require authorization, but uh, everything that has personal data or has interaction with our systems require authorization. So how does it look under the hood? Um, let's say uh, this, the simple the process of um, submitting a job, for example. So the main, the main question we get, like how does it work? Um, so I'll get to the uh, authorization part uh, in, a, in the next slide. But essentially, once you um, once you acquire a token, you use this one. You can either use it in the Swag Club page to get authorized on the, in the interface page, or you can use it just in the you know whatever kind of um, tool you use to do um, uh, re requests to like a, a REST interface. But here, let's say how just just um, simplified. Um, so once you have the token, you want to start a compute job. You make a post to compute jobs, and this will immediately return back with a task ID, and instead it will put the job on a message queue, and then Slurm will the the API and has the loop internally where it talks to Slurm, puts the job onto Slurm, and um, and gets the gets the gets feedback from Slurm. So it will also tell you at some point when the when the job is finished. And um, and then you can actually uh, take a look at the at the results uh, of the job. And I have a, no have a notebook um, coming up next that will show you how it's uh, how it's done. Um, but first, sorry, first let's still go over uh, like a little painful bit of the API. So you have to be authorized if you want to use the if you want to submit a job. You have to be authorized, and for this you have to obtain what we call a client um, from NERSC. 
and that's uh, you get this client over the iris interface. The, the client essentially is just like a like an SSH key or should be treated like an SSH key. So it's a secret that we use to and when you're talking with our IDC server to exchange it uh, for like a short lived access token. The access token is what you need to use the API, but you first need like a some some form of of secret um, to to exchange for an access token. And that is guarded by multi-factor authorization. So you have to go through Iris. So here's our Iris page. And if you want to make a client, go to profile. And then at the very bottom here is our super facility API clients. So you create a client here, you can give it a name. You actually um, can change change the security level for this client. So if you want to do all the functions, you have to go through red. But one, if you use red, then we restrict the lifetime of the client and we also re restrict the source IP ranges for this particular um, interaction with the API. Um, so you do this, you can add um, your, your IP ranges here. And then uh, let me just type something. It's my IP. A red token and then press OK. And then you get uh, your you get a private key and the client ID and that you will use in the API. Okay, let's see. All right, we're there with the demo. So here I have a Jupyter notebook open that kind of uh, shows uh, just the basic interaction with the API. This is a bit counterintuitive because an interactive way to explore the API just as you would do for the Swagger page, but it's meant for automation. So this is maybe mainly for explorative purposes and for, uh, for educational purposes. Um, so the beginning is just like a few wrappers. So it, it gets a bit easier for us to work with the API here. You don't get uh, so much um, um, boilerplate code to look at. So let me just quickly jump through this, wait, it's here. All right. So first thing we do is we take our secret here and exchange it for an access token. That just happened here. So now we have like an access token to use the API and you also see that it expires in uh, 10 minutes. We but uh, you know, according to the workflow, we first need to check you know if there's, the systems are up or not. So uh, we go and query the status API. Here we do it a bit more explicit, and later we use the wrappers more and more. Um, anyway, just get request to this URL, and we see today uh, permit is active. But you can also query all the other services that interested for you, that you might be interested in, like. The, the data transfer nodes or the community file system, or if you want to do Globus transfer, you can check if Globus is working. And we're lucky today is everything is working. Looking into the future, you can look at all the plan outages here. Gives you a nice machine readable list. Let's get to the meat. So I'm jumping, I'm going a bit faster through this. So this is just the batch job, as you might know when you submit a batch job to nurse, just like here, wrapped in a, a string. So we're using here is we're taking this the string and, and using the command endpoint to essentially uh, just create a, a file uh, from this string on uh, on the on parameter. So you see that the command endpoint is asynchronous, so it spawned a task ID, and we're calling this task ID continuously to see what's com what's coming out there. Uh, at some point it says status okay. So it has, um, the the command has been executed. And if you look in the, oh, sorry, it's a different, different folder. Hmm. I oh, don't know where, oh, sorry. Should be here. Yeah, so here I created a job script that we can also submit to, um, to Nurse. We can also use, we don't actually have to use Jupyter here. We can also use the API to query if the job script has, job script has been created. 
and this will just use the ls command in, utility, in the utilities endpoint. So it's there, everything's good. We can submit it to the queue. We do this with compute jobs. That's a post request here. And again, we're polling, so it creates a task. And uh, when the task says, okay, that means that the the command to submit the, the to submit this job has been done. So it, so it means that now Slurm has accepted this particular job. And now we can query um, the status of the job. And we're lucky it ran right away. It's, sometimes you get it that it's still pending and take a while depending on like what kind of job you submitted, which queue, what you submitted to debug, so it's quite quick. Let's do this again. And it's done. Okay. All right, now you can read from the Slam output file. This is just an this example script. Really didn't do much. Um, but again, this goes to the command endpoint. So it's asynchronous, you're calling the tasks. And the job, the the what the job was supposed to do is was to print the host name, wait a wait a minute, and then tell you that it's done. And it uh, here is the host name, node ID 5262, and it says it's finished. So that all work well. So this is kind of an example how you can submit a job uh, over the API, query the status, and query the um, the progress of your job. Okay. So this is um, as you see, this was if if you look at the notebook, it worked with Nurse Python. So this this all these interaction with the wrappers just work with our standard Python environment because it already has like libraries to to interface with um, with uh, with REST APIs. But we also provide an SF API client Python library, and the host of this uh, data day Nick is one of the architects of this uh, Python library. So if you have any more questions, you can go to him. Um, but it's a, it's a more Pythonic way to interact with the API. So all the interactions spawn objects and you query the object attributes to know what's going on. That's, um, you know, it uses pedantic um, to to uh, to make sure that the API responses and the, the, what you submit is, is correct. And it has both an asynchronous and synchronous client. Oops. So as I told you, many of the interactions are asynchronous, but all these polling and waiting that we had to do manually in the notebook is kind of hidden in the uh, in the Python client. So it, if you if you go for a synchronous, it will do all this uh, waiting for you, um, and just it, for you it doesn't really look like the interface is asynchronous. It just looks it just it just takes its time to give you in a result. Um, for the client, you can check the code on GitHub and. Um, as a documentation page and even like a, a user Slack for this. And you know, just as the ASIP API is a service, you can, if you have any questions about this, you can go and submit a ticket. You can also specify as an API client in this, and then you hopefully get directed to the right consultant who can help you uh, with the client. Um, the client is not installed in our standard Python environment, so you would have to do this manually. So you create a custom environment and uh, install the, the client there. And I had um, I had a demo, but we're kind of running through the end here. So um, maybe I, I point you to uh, the client repo. This here is the GitHub repo for this. And we, for the NARC 2023 training, uh, we have a three hour tutorial on how to use the API and the API client with a huge chunk of this, and there is um, some uh, code for this in the NERSC SFA, SF API training repo, where you can take a look and explore uh, the features of the client uh, yourself. Okay. So I think that's it. This was just a, it was a really a sh very short crash course in the API and a kind of, um, advise you to go to the training. We have three hours of YouTube for you to watch. <laughs> there's plenty, there's way more slides, way more explanation that I could touch on here. Uh, so please go there. And I have like one last 
slide uh, with remarks. Um, so yeah, if you ever want to know about the API, you wanna you have trouble or you have suggestions. Uh, the API is a service, so you, if you go on Tab and Asset Golf and you select what you, your ticket is about, you can select SF API as the service um, that you want to ask something about. We have extended documentation, documentation here at Docs and Asset Golf, a service is a SF API. I mentioned the SF API client GitHub repo, and oops, here is the, the link to the user training. And for the future, we have a few things coming up for the API. Um, was like one thing was um, that this is just a NERSC API currently, but we are discussing with other DEHP centers to harmonize APIs, or they actually were interested and say, "Oh, we want to build an API. Can we use you as a starting point?" And so we are um, in in discussions. I think a year already with the other DEHP uh, centers, and we keep you posted you know, what the outcome of this uh, discussion is. Another pain point was that the lifetime of the client was very short, particularly for those that actually execute work. So we're also looking into um, using templates or containers. So you can, if you, you, if you restrict you, the, the things you wanna do with the API, we might be able to give you a longer client lifetime in return. But this is a field of uh, active invest active investigation. You know, using API in HPC context is new, especially also from the from the security standpoint. So this has to be reviewed quite carefully. So um, this will probably take a while until we get something out of this. And we're also looking into automated reservations of the API because you know, if you think about the LCS workflow, they have like uh, certain chunks of time where they have experiments and they need to. Uh, they need to know that they have the compute um, available during that time. And the way we do this usually is with reservations. Our reservations go through a, a manual process, you know, so the ticket and it gets reviewed and then it gets implemented. And we are we're currently looking into ways to do this automated uh, with the API, uh, you know, for 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 specific for specific use. Okay, that's it. Um, if there are any questions, please speak up. Great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> are there any questions in the room or online that we have? Okay, great. Yeah. And there's also, yeah, like, like Baron was saying, there's tons of resources online. Uh, if you're, um, looking for more resources on the, on the SF API. Yeah, I think the best way is to start from the the NARP training, and then you get like the the slides, and there is the slides itself itself have links. I have I have an updated version of the slide, with even more links. And yes, you can download the sample notebooks. Yeah, yeah. I'll make sure to update the here. the slides for you to with the, all all the links in it. Okay. Okay. Great. Any more questions? No. All right. Thank no. you so much for letting me talk today, and um, apologies for this uh, for this march for the API. That's it's quite a lot of ground to cover. Great. Let's thank our speaker again.